the causes and the factors for the rise of the kingdom of Axum. The causes or the factors for the rise of the kingdom of Axum. And by that we'll be looking at things that helped Axum to develop as one of the ancient kingdoms and for it to be one of the earliest civilizations in Africa. Again, before the lesson ends, you would be able to give an account of how Christianity was introduced to Axum. It's an interesting story. And then we would also go ahead to look at the effect that the introduction of Christianity had on Axum. That's after Christianity has been introduced to Axum, what impact did Christianity have on the kingdom of Axum and its people? And before the lesson closes, we'd be able to outline and look at the various achievements of Axum in art and technology. So you can see we have a detailed discussion tonight and we're going to look at various aspects of Axum kingdom and their civilization. We'd want to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. is two years. Oh, how time flies. Today I have been a benefactor and students in this country and beyond are also benefactors. We appreciate even how you handled the inconveniences that came with the lockdown with the COVID, even helping students to learn even in their homes. So with your two years anniversary, we say congrats and keep up the good work you are doing. We wish you success in the future. And I know that Ghanaians are expecting more from you. Two might sound very similar in a way, but Joy Lenny has done a lot. And on this note, I would want to wish Joy Lenny a happy two-year anniversary. The whole country is now into it. They are watching Joy Lenny, they are learning. So I would only say that it should continue and it should work harder than before. I hope that many more students will find it not just as an appendix, but as an integral part of their learning experiences. Let's encourage our wards or our kids to watch Joy Lenny so they learn something better because day in day out new things are being taught. For mathematics in particular, I look forward to the day when because of Joy Lenny and every other such intervention, mathematics would not be feared, it would be revered, respected, loved. I mean, the kind of subject that you don't run away from when you hear it, but you embrace it. Joy learning. 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 Oh, and welcome back from that quick break. We just went through the objectives for tonight's live show. Now, you know that you are writing history paper on the 30th of this month. It may seem far, but it's not that far. We are counting in days, as you know. And so I want to, before we start the discussion on tonight's topic, which is the civilization of Axum and the Kingdom of Ethiopia, I want to quickly look at a few things about the history paper as you prepare for the Wasi paper on the 30th of this month. Now, we want to look at WASI 2020 and how you can make an A in history. So, making an A. I want to believe that by now your mind is made that you're going for A and nothing else. It is possible. 
People say that history is difficult. Well, it's a subject for discussion, but everything begins with the mind. If you accept that, no matter what, since you have gone through the various discussions and class lessons, you can make an A, you can make it. Once your mind is made, you can make it. Now, let's look at the components of the paper quickly. The components of the paper. You know that you're going to have 50 objectives. And the objectives would not cover every topic. There are specific topics that have been selected for the objective section. Now, if you are able to study your objectives very well, solve some objective questions so well, and you're able to, out of the 50, score 40 or above, I think you are halfway through your way to making an A. Let me quickly remind you of a few topics that you should expect for the objective section. Now, for the objective section in your studies, make sure you concentrate on the histography. And with the histography, we are looking at introduction to history, talking about what history is, and I know you know that by now. You look at why it is important to study history. Have you just remembered one of them? Will you remember any? Yes. History is important because as a subject, it helps us to be patriotic. I'm sure you just remembered. So as we study history, as we take an account of, for instance, Ghana's independence, we look at the big six, we look at Dr. Nkrumah, we look at a, uh, Dr. J.B. Damkwa, we look at Obechebi Lamte, we look at Edward Akufuadu, Akwaje, and the rest. You realize that it tells you how these people sacrificed their lives or were willing to put their lives on the line for the sake of Ghana. So all these things help us to understand the histography. Again, in this section, you would have to remember to revise on the various sources that are available for the study of history. And I know you remember that you would have to look at the documentary sources and then you look at the non-documentary sources. So I'm just trying to remind you of things you should look out for, especially for the objectives section. So after looking at historiography, you also remember to look at the introduction to Islam in West Africa. That's another objective topic. After looking at the introduction of Islam in West Africa, you look at the civilization of West African Sudan which is another topic. And again, you do well to look at the introduction of Christianity or Christian missionary activities, which is another topic for the section A or the objective paper. Remember to look at the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade. That is also an objective topic. Don't forget to look at introduction or the coming of the Europeans to West Africa. The coming of the Europeans to West Africa is another important topic you need to look at for the objective section. Don't forget again to look at colonial rule in West Africa as another topic in your revision for the objective paper. In addition to that, remember to also look at the partition of Africa and the scramble for Africa. So these are some of the objective topics. And indeed, you also try to revise on Ghana in the international community. And with Ghana in the international community, we are looking at Ghana's relationship with, for instance, the OAU, or Ghana's participation in the OAU, the AU, ECOWAS, and UN, as well as other international bodies and the various role that Ghana played. So when you have concentrated or have looked at these objective topics, you try also to solve some objective questions. Just lay hold on any past question paper that you have. 
go through the objective sections and you realize that these topics that I have made mention of are the topics that you will see in the objective session. Now, a careful look at the objective paper of any WASI pass question will help you know that most of the civilization topics are not featured in the objectives, with the exception of, for instance, civilization of West Africa, Sudan. And so, if you are learning for the objectives, make sure that your concentration is on some of the topics I have just mentioned to you, especially for your objectives. And trust me, continuous solving of your objective questions is what would help you to score. And I want you to score 40 and above out of the 50 objective questions that you are likely to have in the section A. All right. Now, in the section B, you realize that the sections have been divided into three major subdivisions. So we have the section A, which deals usually with the civilization topics. And so you would have four questions. You come to the B part, which has to do with the history of Ghana, especially from the pre-colonial era through to the colonial era. And then you come to the C section, which usually looks at the history of Ghana and her relationship with other communities. And so that one would cover the various social and political development, usually from the period 1900 till the Third Republic. Now, I'm just trying to help you take a look at what you should expect or what you need to know with respect to the paper that you'll be writing. The paper would demand that you answer four questions out of the total number of questions you have been given. Now, the instruction is that the four questions that you are answering, you make sure you answer at least a question from a section. Students usually have a challenge with this particular instruction. Mostly they ask that, well, the sections are in three. We have section A, section B, section C. How am I able to select the fourth one? What it means is that when you have satisfied selecting at least a question from each other, you are now at liberty to select the fourth question from any of the sections that you want. So it's possible or you can select two questions from section A. If you realize that there are some two questions in section A, that you can answer so well. That after you have answered a question from each section, you may decide to choose your fourth question from section A. If you think the next available question to you is in section A. Now, if you realize that the fourth question you can answer is in section B, then you can answer another question from section B after you have satisfied the earlier at least one question from section B. If it so happens that the fourth question you want to answer is found in section C, if you have already answered one question in section C, you can still add that question as your fourth question. So by all means, make sure that at least you have answered a question from a section. Somebody is asking, is it very important to follow this rule? Yes, it is. A student of mine had a B2. And when the results came, she cried. And she said she was supposed to make an A because she answered the four questions. So after talking to her for a while, she came to herself that she ended up answering three questions at a particular section and failed to answer a question from one other section. So what it means is that though she answered the four questions that is required, but she failed to answer a question from a particular section. She rather answered three questions from one section 
and a question from the other section. So please pay attention to the instructions before you start. Now, don't forget that clarity is of importance. How clear you write or how clear you are with whatever that you are communicating for the examiner to mark. So that is it about the instructions. Now, after you have read the instruction, I would advise you, this is what you need to do. So the focus is now on what you have to do. Now that you understand the instructions, what you have to do is take at least five minutes, carefully go through all the questions. Take five minutes at least, go through all the questions. Now read all the questions and look out for your understanding. Be sure whether you understand the questions and you know what the demands of the questions are. If you are done going through the questions, what you need to do is, now, make sure you start with the questions you can easily answer, or you can answer with a lot of ease. Yes, if you're able to start with the questions that you have mastery over, it boosts your confidence. It has a way of encouraging you. And once you start well, and your first question, you know, puts you up there or gives you that confidence, it helps you to move at a faster pace. Please don't try to impress anybody. The examiner is not looking out for your impression. The examiner is looking out for your understanding. And each question carries equal mark. So why would I want to start with a difficult question? Or why would I want to choose a difficult question when I can have probably a much more easier, relatively, question that I can answer? So my advice to you is that after you have read through the questions, make sure you understand. And when you have established that you have an understanding of the question, start with the easiest question. What may be easy to you may not be easy for the next person. So I'm talking about what you find easier. Start with it. Now, when you start, make sure you start by making an outline. Because, for instance, if you've been asked to write about four factors for a particular event or four factors that caused a particular event, before you start writing, Make sure you make an outline, either at the back of the booklet or you make it on the page you want to start with, probably with a pencil. So afterwards, if you would want to cancel or erase. But you can still do that with your pen without creating any problem. So if you want to make an A, make sure that before you start answering, after you have established your understanding, make an outline. Get your five points settled before you start developing them. Now, it gives you the ability to remember or to be able to provide the required number. One question student asks is, Sir, what if I have more than the number of questions required? Now, if you have more than the number of questions required, what you have to do is that, Make sure you write the required number and be sure of what you've written. You could add at least one point or two if you have. But don't forget, the examiner is in a hurry to make sure that he marks correctly and yet he can mark faster. So be sure you provide the required number and then you can move on. Now, when you have satisfied all these conditions, make sure you time yourself. Look at the number of hours you've been given, and then look at the number of questions you are answering. Divide the time for it. Give yourself a limit by which you should have finished answering a question. And then you give a little time for reading over whatever that you have written. And with all these, if you are able to follow through and do this, it's a good start. And with this, you are able 
to come out with an A. Each question carries 15 marks. And so be sure to satisfy the number of points you have been asked to rate. Once you do that, you are on your way to make an A. I'd be very glad to hear that you made an A in your history. Yes, some student from first year to third year never made an A in school. But in Wasi, because of their determination, and because of their willingness to follow instructions given, they were able to make an A. All right, so that was a quick way or a quick process to take you through to let you know what to expect in your history paper in the WASI 2022, as well as what you need to do. Thanks for following through. Now we want to go to today's topic for our revision show. And like we said earlier, Tonight, we are looking at the civilization of Aksum. Our topic is the civilization of Aksum and ancient Ethiopia. The civilization of Aksum and ancient Ethiopia. Now, Aksum is spelled A-X-U-M. That is the popular spelling that most of us know. But in some cases, it is also spelled A-K-S-U-M. Yes, so either A-X-U-M or, or A-K-S-U-M. Both of them are accepted. But let's just stick to what we are used to, which is the A-X-U-M. So, Axum. The civilization of Axum. Now, I know you remember that in class you were taught that the Europeans who wrote the history of Africa wrote it from their point of view. And they had an Eurocentric view that Africans did not have history, or Africans were barbaric, that Africans were not civilized, and that every civilization that Africans had was a borrowed one. But you as a history student should know by now that Africans had history before the coming of the Europeans. And then we had our own way of developing various things that we developed and how we lived our lives before the coming of the European. And so under the civilization of Axum and Ethiopia, we want to look at the various things that came up or that the people of Axum did that made them become one of the earliest civilizations in the world. Now, let's go through that. We are told that the civilization of Axum took place between the 3rd and 6th century, but the peak, or it began especially from the 4th century BC. So, most people have accepted or are agree that the civilization of Axum started in the 4th century BC. Yes. Now, Axum geographically we are told. So let's have a quick look on our map here with the location of Axum, the geographical location of Axum. So we've already said that the civilization of Axum started or the peak was from the 4th century BC onwards. Axum geographically was found in southeast of Meru. Now we see Meru or Meru here. And Axum is the territory from across here all around. And so if you look at Axum, you realize that just to the east of Axum lies the Red Sea. This is the Red Sea. Moving up across to the Mediterranean territory. And then across the Red Sea, we see Mecca here. And so it enters across the Red Sea. It enters the area of Saudi Arabia. So geographically, we can say that 
axum can be found in the southeast of Meru, and then it has in front of it, or just to its east, the Red Sea. And then across the Red Sea, you see Saudi Arabia around the place. Now, this geographical location and description is important because it would help us going forward to understand how the geographical location of Axum helped it to have contact with other people outside the local settlement. And so the geographical location, as we see on the map here, gives us an idea of where Axum was located and then its benefit. Now, you realize that we find over here the White Nile, telling you that Axum was surrounded by the Nile and then had access to the Nile River. And because of that and because of the Red Sea also, it helped them to also have contact with the people of Egypt. And so going forward, we'll be looking at some factors that helped the kingdom of Axum to rise as a strong kingdom. I hope you can appreciate the map. So we see Adul Adulis here. We see Zila here. And then we see Meru here. And we have already said that Axum is to the south east of Meru. Just in front of it, we see the Red Sea. And across the Red Sea, Saudi Arabia, Mecca, and other places are also found there. Let's now make progress and look at the reasons for the rise of Axum Kingdom. One major factor for the rise of Axum Kingdom is the influx of the immigrant from Yemen. The influx of the immigrant from Yemen. Yes, we are told that the northern highlands of Ethiopia was occupied before the period 700 BC by a group of people referred to as the Kushites. So we are told that a local people by name Kushite, or a people similar to them, occupy the higher lands of Ethiopia. Now, these local Kushites who settled on the upper part of Ethiopia or the highlands of Ethiopia also had others moving down to settle at the lower part of the Ethiopian settlement. So, the People of Kushite, we are told, occupied the higher lands of Ethiopia as well as some occupying the lower lands. Now, the local people Kushite who occupied the higher lands of Ethiopia, we are told, took to agriculture as their mainstay or they involved themselves in agricultural activities. Don't forget, when we're looking at the geographical location of Axum, we said that Axum has the Nile River surrounding it or around its settlement. And so the people depended also on the river available and then undertook agricultural activities. They grew various crops. Apart from those who settled on the highlands of Ethiopia, who took to agriculture as their mainstay or the growing of crops, those Kushite people who settled at the lower part of the Ethiopian highlands also took to pastoralism, or we are told that they were nomadic pastorals. Nomadic pastorals are people who take care of sheep or who rear sheep or animals. That was their mainstay because the lowlands supported or made available grazing crops for their animals. Now, by the period 700 BC, as we said earlier, a group of people migrated from a place known as Yemen or Yemen in Saudi Arabia. They moved from Saudi Arabia, crossed the Red Sea, and came to the highlands of Ethiopia. 
where they met the Kushite people. These immigrants who came for South Arabia were referred to, or they called themselves the Habashat. Habashat, as you can see on the board. So these Habashat moved from South Arabia or Yemen and then came to settle in the highlands of Ethiopia where they met the local people who are called the Kushite. With time, intermarriage took place between the local people or the Kushite and these Habashat or people who had migrated from Yemen. Now, as they intermarried, a new generation or a new population began to emerge. And these populations were known as the Abyssinians. The Abyssinians. So the Abyssinian is a mixture of the local population and the Semitic people or people who had come from Yemen as a result of intermarriage. So we are told that a new Afro-Semitic population emerged. A new Afro-Semitic population emerged. Afro for Africa, Semitic for the people that had come from the South Arabian lands. So it was the migration of these people from Yemen to settle amongst the local Kushite people in the highlands of Ethiopia that laid the foundation for the rise of Axum. And so we can say that the foundation of the rise of the kingdom of Axum was laid by a mixed population that came as a result of intermarriage between the local Kushite people and the Habashat. And that new population is what we are referring to as the Abyssinians. So remember, Habashat are the Yemen population that came, just the Yemen population. And yet when they intermarried with the local Kushite people, the new population or the new people or the children they gave birth to are those who are referred to as the Abyssinians. And we are saying that it was these Abyssinians who laid the foundation for the rise of the kingdom of Axum. I hope you understand that. So we can say that if they had not come, probably the intermarriage would not have taken place for them to have the population known as the Abyssinians. All right, with that understood, let's quickly look at the second factor or reason that contributed to the rise of Axum as a strong kingdom or one of the earliest civilization in Africa. The second reason that contributed to the rise of Axum as a strong kingdom is the ability of its early kings. The ability of its early kings. Yes. We are told that the kings of Axum established Axum as a strong kingdom with its capital at Axum. Now, how were they able to establish Axum as a strong kingdom? They did this by embarking on various wars of conquest. So geographically, we have said that Axum was found at the southeast of Meru or Meru. Now, the kings endeavored to expand or extend the territories of Axum northwards. Eastwards. Sorry. And westwards. So what it means is that they mobilized themselves or the kings mobilized the people and then they took them or embarked on wars of expansion or wars of conquest. Now in the north, 
we are told that the kings of Axum attacked and conquered the territories around Eritrea. That's to the north. The territories of Eritrea as well as Tigui. So the kings were able to extend their territories or expand the territories of Axum from where they were in southeast of Meru and then moved northwards, conquered the people of Eritrea as well as the people of Tigri. Now, we are told that eastward or towards the east, one king by name King Adulis. King Adulis attempted to expand the territory eastward to conquer the place around the southeast of Saudi Arabia. But he failed. King Adulis couldn't conquer that territory. However, we are told by the account that one of his successors was able to conquer the territory southeast of Saudi Arabia. And so that territory of the southern part of Saudi Arabia was conquered by one of the successors of Adulis, and that territory was also added to the kingdom of Axum. So you can see that the expansion is taking place both northward and then eastward. And the intention is to establish Axum as a strong kingdom by expanding their territory and having a lot of states under them. Now westward, we are told that King Izana also conquered various territories, especially Meru, to the west. So he focused his attention westward and was able to conquer the territory of Meru. And then the territory of Meru was now added to the settlement of Axum. This shows that the kings were able to expand the territories. And so we are told that as of the period 250 BC, the kings gave themselves the title Negus Nagasti. Negus Negasti. Negus Negasti means king of kings. Wow, what a title. And definitely so, because they have been able to expand their territories from where they originally were geographically located to include the northern part of their settlement, going as far as Tigri and Eritrea expanding eastward to the part of southeast of Saudi Arabia, and then to the west, including Meru. And so these wars of conquest and the ability of the kings to add all these territories to their kingdom also greatly contributed to the growth or the development of Axum into a strong kingdom. I hope by now you are appreciating how Axum arose, or the kingdom of Axum arose in the 4th century until it fell in the 8th century, which we'll be looking at later on. Now, I want to look at the third reason, or the third factor, that contributed to the rise of Axum. The third factor that contributed to the rise of Axum is the fertility of the land is the fertility of the land. Now you remember we said that the geographical location of Axum enabled the early Kushite or the local population called the Kushite to undertake various agricultural activities. They had rivers around them. They depended on the Nile River to some extent as its tributaries ran through the territory of Axum. And so those in the higher lands of Ethiopia, as we said earlier, 
because of how fertile the land was, it empowered them to undertake various agricultural activities. And so food production increased. With food production increasing and the various agricultural activities going on on the place, it served as a point of attraction that attracted other people from other places to come and settle there to undertake their agricultural activities. Now, we have also said that the lowlands of Ethiopia also had the nomadic pastorals who were undertaking various rearing of animal or animal husbandry activities. And this served as a magnet that attracted various people from various places and gradually the place started expanding or increasing as a result of the fertile lands that supported agricultural activities. Definitely, everybody wants to settle at a place where they can easily have access to food. And so once the land is fertile, once the land supports agricultural activity, it serves as a magnet and it attracted people from all over. And these people came to settle there. And that also contributed to the growth or the rise of Axum Kingdom and that of Ethiopia. I trust we are making progress by now. We want to go on and look at other factors that contributed to the rise of Axum as a strong kingdom or one of the earliest civilizations in Africa. Yes, trade and commerce. So our fourth point, our fourth point for the rise of Axum as a strong kingdom is trade and commerce. Trade played a major role in the rise of Axum as a strong kingdom. Now, if you look at the map we have here, you realize that Axum is over here. Around or to the east of Axum, you realize that we have the Red Sea here. Now, if you look at the red arrows on the map, you realize that to the south, the trade route, so over here, as we can see, the red arrow is an indication of the various trade routes. So the trade route passes in front of the Port Adulis. To the south, it moves down here, and then it comes to the Indian Ocean, taking us to the Asia world or the Asiatic territory. Now, if you look northwards, you realize that the trade route also moved right from in front of Axum at Adulis here, up, 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 up to Europe and to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, all these red arrows that you are seeing are trade routes, giving an indication of various trade activities that was taking place between the people of Axum and these territories. Now, you realize that the arrow also moves interior or inward to Africa or to the hinterland of Africa. Now, someone would ask, how important is this? But before that, let's also look at this arrow. Now, remember, you realize that this trade route also moves to the Arabian Sea. And then, with all these, we realize that various trade routes find themselves geographically passing through an important port in Axum known as the Port Adulis. Port Adulis was an important trade point or entry port for most of the trade activities that was going on between the Mediterranean world and the Indian Ocean, as well as in the interior of Africa. Now, we are told that the Greco Egyptians, that's the Ptolemies, the Ptolemies were the Greek rulers of Egypt. The Greek rulers of Egypt were in need of elephants, which was an important 
animal they needed for military purposes. So elephants were needed by these Ptolemies or the Greek rulers of Egypt for military purposes. Now these elephants abounded in the hinterland of Africa. And then you realize that from the hinterland of Africa or the interior here, definitely the elephant or the trade route will pass through the important port known as Port Adulis. And so this enabled Axum to play a role as a middleman or the role of middlemen between the trade that was taking place between the Mediterranean Sea or Europe, as well as the Indian Ocean, as well as from the interior of Africa, and so on and so forth. Why? Because Port Adulis was the main port of Axum, and it was important entry port for most of these trade activities. Now, with these trade activities passing through, or the trade routes passing through Axum, it gave the kings of Axum the chance to make a lot of money from this trade. So we can say that trade and commerce brought wealth. So trade brought wealth. Sorry. It brought wealth to the kings of Axum. Yes, because almost all the trade activities were passing through the port of Adulis. And they were paying duties to the people of Axum, and that served as the basis of the wealth of the kings. With access to wealth, the kings now were able to acquire various weapons that they needed to embark on most of the wars of expansion we have already spoken about. So don't forget that trade, with trade route passing through Port of Adulis, and as you can see from the map here, from Adulis to the Mediterranean Sea, from Adulis to Indian Ocean, to the interior of Africa from where they were getting these elephants. In addition to the elephants, they also got ivory, which was an important trade item. And all of these brought wealth to Axum. And that enabled the kings of Axum to develop Axum as a strong kingdom and one of the earliest civilizations of the world. Very small. So let's look at the next reason or factor that contributed to the civilization of Axum. So the next point we want to look at, which is closely related to the previous one we spoke about, is the strategic position. Strategic position. So earlier we spoke in about the fact that various important trade items would have to pass through the routes of Adulis or the main port Adulis before they are taken to the Mediterranean world and to the Indian Ocean. The strategic position of Axum, as well as with the Red Sea that is located to the east of Axum, realized that it gave Axum just not access to good land, which was good for agricultural activities, but also it enabled it to establish contact or trade contact with other people of the world, especially the people of Saudi Arabia. Now you realize that from Axum to the Arabian Peninsula, where most trade items were needed, is only the Red Sea that is between them. And so the proximity of Axum to the Arabian Peninsula made it strategic 
to have access to various trade items in addition to the various trade routes that pass through the main port, which is Port Adelis, from where they were receiving most of the trade items, such as the ivory and importantly, the elephant that was needed by the Ptolemies or the Greco Egyptian rulers of Egypt. And so, in a nutshell, we can say that Axum arose as one of the earliest civilizations of the world or one of the strong kingdoms in the world, especially between the period 3rd century and the century as a result of one immigrant or the influx of immigrant from Yemen in South Arabia who came to settle in the highlands of Ethiopia intermarried with the local Kushite population gave birth to a new generation known as the Abyssinians and then two the ability of the early kings of Axum to embark on various wars of conquest northward, eastward, and westward, as well as their ability to establish themselves or refer to themselves as king of kings, definitely as a result of the various achievements they have obtained. And then three, we also spoke about trade and commerce, the role trade played in the rise of Axum as it brought wealth to the kings of Axum and enabled them to embark on various wars of expansion. We also spoke about the fertility of the land that supported agricultural activity, making way for increase in food production, as well as serving as a point of attraction for many more people to come and settle on the land. And then finally, we spoke about the strategic position of Axum, as we saw from our map, and realize that these factors are the main factors that contributed to the rise of action. So if you miss this in WASI 2020, you should be able to answer and answer well. Want to make progress and look at our question of the day, and then we would go for a commercial break. But before we go for the break, let's take the question for the day. Are you ready? Now don't forget that those who would call in and get the questions right would stand a chance of winning wonderful package from Joy Learning. So let's look at the question of the day. Our question of the day is briefly describe how Christianity got to Axum. Briefly describe how Christianity got to Axum, or better still, give an account of the introduction of Christianity to Axum. That is the A part of our question. And the B part is what impact did Christianity have on Axum? What impact did Christianity have on Axum? I hope you have the questions written down. Now, when we come back, you would call us on the following numbers to give your answers and share your answers with us so you can win a wonderful package. When we return from the break, you can call us on 0302-211-705. Let me take it again. You can call in and answer the question or share your contributions through 0302-211-705 or 0302-211-706. 0302-211-706. All right. So we will be right back to answer our question of the day. See you back.
just a click away on your phone, tablet, and computer. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Joy Learning TV and watch our recorded lessons. The Revision Show is now live on Joy Learning TV on your multi TV Digibox and on Facebook at Joy Learning TV. Every pro update on our educative programs as well as fun concepts. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Joy Learning TV and on Instagram at Official Joy Learning TV. Joy Learning. Keep learning. Just a click away on your phone, tablet, and computer. Subscribe to our YouTube. We are here again. The time is up for the Joy Learning Revision Show. The time is up for our dear final year senior high school learners to start preparing for their final year WASI. And as always, our TV teachers are ever ready to take you through your revision sessions on Ghana's first ever educational TV channel, Joy Learning. Presenting to you word problems in mathematics. The SHS Revision Show is coming with a new segment called the Question of the Day. And students who will answer the specific subject questions correctly will be rewarded. Dear final year learners, don't be left out of this year's SHS Revision Show every Monday to Friday at 7.30 p.m. And remember to tell a friend to tell a friend that the time is up for the Revision Show. Our sellers are going into the market. The profit margins will be falling. Starting on Monday, 13th June 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Joy Learning. Keep learning. Are you on vacation and desperately want to catch up with the syllabus? Silla silla. Don't fret because Joy Learning is giving you free extra classes not only on TV but on Zoom. Did you encounter any challenges with certain topics at school? Bring them here and we will help you get it solved with no sweat, Charlie. We are offering you a one-on-one -on -one teaching and learning opportunity with our award-winning TV teachers. Is it mathematics, general science, English language or any of the elective subjects that you have challenges with. Meet our teachers for easy solutions. How do you join these free extra classes on Zoom? 1. Download the Zoom app from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. 2. Create your username. 3. Look for our Zoom meeting password on all our social media handles every week. And voila! You are good to join our virtual classroom from the comfort of your home. Make a date this Saturday with your facilitator at 12 noon prompt. The Joy Learning teacher and you, we don't stop learning. Joy Learning. Keep learning. Joy Learning is two years. Oh, how time flies. Today I have been a benefactor and students in this country and beyond are also benefactors. I appreciate even how you handled the inconveniences that came with the lockdown with the COVID, even helping students to learn even in their homes. So with your two years anniversary, we say congrats and keep up the good work you are doing. We wish you success in the future. And I know that Ghanaians are expecting more from you. Two might sound very similar in a way, but Joy Learning has done a lot. And on this note, I would want to wish Joy Learning a happy two year anniversary. The whole country is now into it. They are watching Joy Learning, they are learning. So I would only say that it should continue and it should work harder than before. I hope that many more students will find it not just as an appendix, but as an integral part of their learning experiences. And let's encourage our wards or our kids to watch Joy Learning so they learn something better because day in, day out, new things are being taught. For mathematics in particular, I look forward to the day when because of Joy Learning and every other such intervention, mathematics would not be feared. It would be revered, respected, loved. I mean, the kind of subject that you don't run away from when you hear it, but you embrace it. Joy Learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning. Joy learning.
Hello and welcome back from that break. All right. So as we keep saying, keep learning, let's keep learning. And I remind you that tonight we are having our revision show for history. And I'm your teacher and facilitator, Albert Kingsley Bray. Now, before we went for the commercial break, I announced the question of the day. And let's take the question of the day again. The A part of our question of the day is asking us to briefly describe how Christianity got to Axum or the introduction, to discuss the introduction of Axum, Christianity, I beg your pardon, to Axum. So you're supposed to give an account of the introduction of Christianity to Axum. And then the B part requires us to discuss or elaborate on the various impact that the introduction of Christianity had on action. Now the numbers to call again, as I announced earlier, is 0302 211705. 0302 or 0302 211706. Now, remember that if you answer a question correctly, there is a wonderful package for you. So keep your calls coming as we continue with the class. We would start as and when your call coming would give you a chance to answer a question so you can win yourself a wonderful package. Okay, so let's now move on and then take an account of the introduction of Christianity to Axum as we wait for your call. So as I progress, you can equally call and then share with us what you know about the introduction of Christianity to Axum and you could win yourself a wonderful package. All right. Now, the story of how or the history of how Christianity got to Axum is quite interesting. Someone may compare it to the story of Romeo and Juliet, you know, as they had the, their ship, you know, sinking or the shipwreck that they suffered. But in this case, it wasn't a story of love, but it was a story of how a young Syrian Christian and the brother were shipwrecked on the Ethiopian coast. And so we are told that Christianity came to Axum in the year AD 333. Christianity was introduced to Axum in the year AD 333. Now it so happened that there was a shipwreck on the Ethiopian coast. So one, a shipwreck Sorry. A shipwreck on the Ethiopian coast. Now, when there was a shipwreck, only two people survived. Or we say that two brothers were the only survivors or the sole survivors of this shipwreck. Now, these two brothers are one, Frumentius. Frumentius and two, Edusius. These two brothers were the only survivors of a shipwreck on the Ethiopian coast. And so when they were rescued, these two survivors, or these two brothers, who happened to be Syrians and Christians, were taken to the palace of the king of Axum. Now, when they got to the palace of the king of Axum, they decided to help build churches or to build churches for the various Roman merchants that were in Axum. Hello. 
Please, your name and where are you calling from? I... Kindly lower the volume of your TV set and let's speak on the phone. Please lower the volume of your television and let's talk on the phone. My name is Rain. 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 Rainy. Okay. Please, where are you calling from? Rainy, where are you calling from? Okay, which of the questions do you want to answer? Really, you may have to call back your... Hello? Your line is bad. Please call again. I would be glad to have you. Please call back. Do well to call back, Rini. All right. You can also call us on 0302-211-705 or 0302-211-706. All right. So as we were saying... The sole survivors of the shipwreck on the Ethiopian coast, who happened to be Frumentus and Odysseus, who are brothers. And we've said that these were Christ Christians from Syria. When they were handed over to the king of Axum as the survivors of the shipwreck, the brothers took advantage to help build churches for the Roman merchants or traders who had come from Rome to trade in Axum. Now, we are told that the king made Frumentius the steward of his kingdom and then made his brother Odysseus the cup bearer. Hello, Vincent. Yes. Where are you calling us from? The question. Yeah, okay, so you sp speak to us. Answer the question. I want the question too. Okay, Vincent, the question is give us an account of the introduction of history of Christianity, sorry, to Axum. To give us an account of the introduction of Christianity to Axum. Oh, our lines are not helping. Vincent, do well to call again. So I have displayed the question. Relay. Please lower the volume on your television. I can hear you. Let's talk. And kindly move away from the television set. Hello. All right. So we would work on the lines. Keep calling. Keep calling. I've displayed a question again. The A part is asking us to describe how Christianity got to Axum. And the B part is asking us to look at the impact that Christianity had on Axum civilization. All right. So back to the account as we wait for your call. Frumentus was made a steward and Odysseus a cup bearer. And so I've already said that Frumentus took advantage of the position he was given to build churches for the Roman merchant. Now, over time, we are told that the king of Axum died and the successor who was younger and so could not take over the reins of the throne the queen invited Frumentius and the brother to serve as regent or co-regent with her. So people who occupied the position until a substantive king was elected or was appointed. And so Frumentius introduced, took advantage of this to introduce his religion, which is Christianity, to the people of Axum. Now, initially, Christianity faced some persecution. However, we are told that when King Ezana became king of Axum, he got converted through the teachings of these brothers and he became a Christian. So King Ezana now becomes a Christian. 
Now, as a king, when he became a Christian, he now declared Christianity a national religion. So, there is a shipwreck on the Ethiopian coast. So, survivors happen to be Christians from Syria. And these Christian brothers are invited to help serve, serve in the palace. Tremendous is appointed a steward, the brother Odysseus appointed a car bearer and they take advantage of that to build churches for Roman merchants in the territory. Later, the king in the person of King Exana is also converted through their teachings and when he got converted, he declared Christianity a national religion. And so Christianity now was declared as the accepted religion all through the territories of Axum. Now, we are told that Frumentius went to Alexandria in Egypt to recruit a bishop for the church in Axum. Now, when he got to Alexandria in Egypt, one of the Christian patriarchs by name Saint Athanasius. Let me help you with the writing. So, Fremantus decided that now that Christianity has been established as a state religion, churches have been built, we need to have a bishop. So he went to Alexandria in Egypt. Hello, Relay. Hello. Uh -huh. I think your line is better now. Okay, so let's hear your answer. Which one are, is it the A or B you are answering? Uh -huh. do, do you remember the question, please? Yes, please. Question one. The first one? Yes. Okay, so we are all here. Let's go. Okay, thank you. Christianity was introduced in Azim in the year. 333 AD. Okay. It was an incident that happened in uh, a shipwreck. Okay. And there was a two survivors, two brothers. Okay. Who was the only survivor of the shipwreck? Okay. Prometheus and Odysseus. Okay. All right. Would you add more or you are done? I'm still answering. You are done, huh? No, please. Okay, I'm listening. So let's make it quick. The king of Azu uh -huh. sent his guys to help them. Okay. So, um, Frumitius was not a king steward. Okay. And Odysseus was up there. Move a little away from your TV. You are doing well. Go on. And through that, he. Okay. Are you done? Are you done? No. Okay. I think you've done very well. Clap for yourself. You've done very well. So stay tuned. Let's also listen to the others who will call in. At the end of the day, I'll announce. Who won the prize for today? So you can call and then come and receive your reward. So well Thank done, you. Rini. Well done. Clap for yourself. That was a good account. It shows that you've been revising your note and you've been following the lesson. You can also call in 0302 211705 or 0302 211706. All right. So at this point, Fumentius go to Alexandria in Egypt to recruit a bishop. And then I told you that a patriarch of Christianity in Egypt by name Saint Athanasius or Athanasius decides that Fumentius will rather be made the bishop of the church of Axum. So Frumentius became the first bishop in 
the first bishop of the church of Axum. And that was how Christianity got to Egypt, and from there on, it went on until it declined. So in brief, this is how Christianity was introduced to Axum. A calamity turned out to be a blessing. So let's look at the B part. Rini has called in, and then she gave us a good account. The B part is asking us to look at the impact or to talk about the impact, or better still, the effects that Christianity had on the civilization of Axum. Now let's move on and look at the impact as we wait for your call. Hello, Amina. Yes, please. Where are you calling us from? Please, I'm calling from Western Region. Western region, specifically where? Specifically in Izinibu. Izinibu, that's good. Yes, please. All right, so let's hear you. And um, please, I want to answer question one. Question one? Yes, please. Why not question two? Um, I just want to give a try to see whether I've captured everything. That is the like question one? Yes, please. Okay, so let's hear you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how Christianity was introduced in Anjum. Quickly. And then Christianity came to Anjum in the year AD 333. Uh -huh. And then there was an incident that happened and there, were, there was a shipwreck. Uh -huh. And it, uh, that happened at where Anjum was. Okay. Then two brothers were survived, survived after the shipwreck. Okay. So those two brothers were Prometheus and Adiosus. Okay. So they were from Assyria. Yeah. So after they have been rescued, they were taken to the palace of Anjim, mm -hmm. where the king is. Mm -hmm. And then when they were there, they, uh, they, they were given some positions okay. at their places. Okay. So the king gave um the um, steward, yes, uh -huh. and then Adiosus the cup bearer. Okay. So with with that their position, they were able to establish churches in in Anjum okay. for the Roman merchants that came. Okay. So with that, uh, as time went on, the king died. Okay. And then. A new king was introduced, and he was King Ezama, and he was converted into Christianity, and okay. he, de he declared Christianity as their um, worship or practice that they go through. Okay. So with that, they needed somebody to help in leading the church. Okay. So the king went to Assyria, in, sorry, Alexandria in Egypt, okay. and took a bishop called Saint Antonius, mm -hmm. and then he came and assisted Mentius and the brother to rule. Um, sorry, to okay. lead the people as they go through Christianity. So please, that's how Christianity was introduced. Well done, Amina. Well done. Well captured. So Amina, stay tuned. I would announce the winner. Okay. okay Before the close, you may be the lucky winner. Okay. Okay, so All right. thank you. Well done, and clap for yourself. All right. So I'm glad you guys are revising well and you are following the show. It shows that you are ready for your history. And I assure you that if you keep up the pace and you keep learning, as Joy Learning ask us to do, A is assured. A quick look at the various impacts. Now you can call in to also share with us what impact you know Christianity made on Axum. The first impact that Christianity had on Axum, as we want to look, is a close bond 
with the Coptic Church of Egypt. Now, when Christianity was introduced in Axum and then declared a state religion by King Azana, we are told that, as we just heard Amina also remind us, Mentius went to Alexandria because in Africa, Coptic Church had started in Egypt. If you remember the civilization of Egypt, Christianity in Egypt, Coptic Church, which was an African form of worship, was advancing or was advanced in Egypt. And so, because Frumentius went to Alexandria to recruit a bishop and he was made a bishop, this brought a close link between the church in Naxum and the church in Egypt in terms of their beliefs, their customs, and religious practices. So the church, Christian church in Axum became closely knitted to the church in Egypt. So we can say that Christianity in Axum brought about a close bond between the church in Axum and the church in Egypt. And by this we're talking about the Coptic church in Egypt. So that is the first impact. The second impact is that Christianity inspired missionary activity in Axum. It inspired missionary activities in Axum. Yes. Now, the faith, which is the Christian faith, has been introduced to them. The king, Ezana, has been converted. He declares the religion as a state religion. And then the teachings of Coptic Christianity begins to flourish in Axum. More people took to the spread of the gospel or the Christian religion in Axum. This wouldn't have been the case if Christianity had not been introduced to them. But after Christianity was introduced to the people, it stirred up or inspired more people in Axum to spread Axum beyond territories from Axum. So we are told that Christianity went as far as places such as Enaya. It went to another place known as Kaffa. And then it also spread to a place known as Janjeru. Now, so you can see that after Christianity has been introduced, more people were inspired to carry the faith to take it across the boundaries or beyond the boundaries of Axum. And that is a positive impact that Christianity had on Axum. Now let's look at another impact. Hello. Yes. Your name again and where are you calling from? My name is Ose Kelvin. Okay, Kelvin. I'm from Sunyane Odomasi. Calling from Sunyane Odomasi. Good to have you. Can we hear your answer? Please listen to me on your phone, not on the television, and reduce the volume. For the second one. Okay, the second one. Let's hear you. I'm listening, please. Hello, Kelvin. Yes, madam. Yes, sir. So let's hear you on the impact of Christianity on Axum. Quick. Oh, Kelvin. Kelvin, you can call again. Now, I want to look at the third impact. And the third impact is that Christianity inspired or it's brought about the growth of monastic ideas. It brought about the development of monastic ideas. This has to do with the growth of various monasteries where people gave themselves completely or totally to religious activities and then settled as secluded places where all they did was to concentrate on religious activities and its expansion. So apart from Christianity inspiring people to share the gospel around or to carry the religion beyond the borders of Axum, 
it also brought the idea of people separating themselves or giving themselves completely to monastic activities. So possibly maybe you can compare to what we have in modern days in the Catholic Church when some people devote themselves you know, completely for religious activities and all that. We are told that when Christianity was introduced in action, it inspired monastic ideas. Now, with the coming of Christianity, it also came with one economic benefit, which was the introduction of crafts, or the people were introduced to craft works. Yes. So, gradually, people were taught how to do weaving. The concept of weaving, as people became converts, you know, after you pray, you have to eat. Or you have to do something so that God will bless it to flourish. So, they were taught how to weave. There were others who were taught how to work with iron or with various minerals to create, for instance, ornaments. Hello, Emmanuel. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Where are you calling from, Emmanuel? Hello. Where are you calling from? Swedro. Okay, let's hear you. Please don't listen to the television. Let's talk on the phone. Reduce the volume on your TV. We are listening. Okay, I'll take the second one. Okay, I'm listening. Um. Oh, Emmanuel, God with us. Come again, Emmanuel. I would love to hear your answer for the second question. Yeah, so we say that with the coming of Christianity, it didn't only come with the inspiration to spread the gospel. It didn't only come with monastic ideas, but it also came with the introduction of the teaching of various crafts, such as weaving and such as the production of various ornaments using various minerals, such as bronze, brass, and iron, and coal. So people were taught how to weave various clothes and then design this ornament. And that also helped their economic life. And so we can say that Christianity also brought an economic benefit to Axum. All right. As we wait for your call, let's make progress and look at another impact. Hello, Vincent. Hello. Yeah, Vincent, please lower your volume and listen to me on your phone. Okay, uh -huh. I'm coming. Please lower your volume and listen to me on your phone. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh, Vincent, let's go. All right, we may have to continue. Vincent, I don't know why your line keeps failing you, but let's make progress. Now, another impact is that Christianity inaugurated a new era of peace. Yes, it brought a new era of peace. Proud to the introduction of Christianity in Axum, the people practiced a religion that had to do with the worship of nature gods. So they worshipped various nature gods, such as the god of the sky, the god of the earth, and various sacrifices were made to these gods before the introduction of Christianity. Until Christianity was made a state religion by King Ezana, most of the Christians faced persecution from the people of Axum who were practicing the old religion, which had to do with the worship of idols or smaller gods. However, when Christianity was made a national religion by King Ezana, it made everybody accept and realize that this is the new way to go. And so there is no need for us to persecute or prosecute those who spread the Christian religion. And this brought about peace amongst the people. So once we all accept that we now have a common religion, 
we see ourselves as one and we would not have to persecute or prosecute anybody who spreads the religion. Hi, Rita. Hi. Good to have you. Where are you calling from? Calling from Eastern Region. Where in Eastern Region, please? Sampaneye. Sampaneye? Yeah. That's good to know. All right, Rita, let's hear your answer. I want to answer the question too. Okay, I'm all yes. The impact of the introduction of Christianity in Augustine. Please go ahead. One, a close bond with the Coptic churches of Egypt. Okay. I've, I've explained that. Raise another point. Okay. Literature flourished. Okay, good. So let's hear you on the literature flourish. Hello, Rita. Oh, Rita. Rita, I'll be waiting for your call. Okay. So we say that once Christianity was accepted and declared by Kinezana as a state religion, everybody accepted it and it became the religion. And there was no need for further persecution or persecution. And that brought about that era of peace. The next point we want to look at, as Rita raised, but unfortunately, her line will not permit her to explain, is literature flourish. Literature flourish. With the introduction of Christianity in Axum, we are told that the Bible and other Christian literature were translated into the Giz language. So Bible, another Christian literature translated in Giz language. Now the Giz language is a mixture or it came up as a mixture of a language brought in by the Semitics. That is the immigrants who came from South Arabia. They came with a language known as the Sabian language. And then the local Kushite people borrowed words from this or borrowed components of this Sabian language plus their local Kush or Kushite language. So Sabian plus the local Kushite language is what gave the Giz language. Now, with the Giz language being translated into, or the Bible translated into the Giz language, as well as other Christian literature, more and more people were taught how to read and write in the Giz language. And we're also told that as a result of the spread of Christianity and the teaching of the Giz language, you know, spreading all across, it enabled the people of Axum to put a lot of things together or write a lot of their historical account. We'll delve more into it when we look at the achievements in the area of art. But for now, we are saying that the Bible was translated in the Giz language and other Christian literature, and it helped more people to learn how to write and read the Giz language. And so Christianity helped the Giz language to flourish or literature to increase or flourish. Let's look at the last benefit of the introduction of Christianity or the impact of Christianity. Hi, Christabel. Hi. Where are you calling us from? Takwa. Takwa, that's good. Yeah. So let's hear you. Let's I hear want to answer uh, the question number two. Please go ahead. Um, Give me a just one. Related to the introduction of new clubs such as mango, mm -hmm. orange, sugar cane, lime, it is seen. Okay. Okay. So it also brought about the introduction of new clubs. Are you done? Um, and uh, number A82. Come again.
Do I have you on the line? The A. The A. Yes. We are done with the A. Good, yes. We are done with the A. So I think let's stay to the B. Clap for yourself. You've done well. Stay tuned. I will announce the winner. And then you can have the prize for the day. God bless you for calling. All right. Let's quickly continue. So that is the contribution Christianity brought in terms of literature flourish. We're saying that another impact Christianity had on Axum is that it laid or imposed a duty on the kings of Ethiopia to spread the gospel. Yes, we've earlier spoken about it inspiring missionary activities. That applies to just every other person. But with this particular impact, we are told, according to the accounts, that the kings who got converted also felt the need to spread the gospel or to spread the Christian religion beyond the boundaries of Axum. Now, they did this by imploring or using military means. Yes. So at this point, the kings of Axum saw it a duty to spread the religion to other parts. And so we are told that they moved southward to spread the religion to the territories that were to the south. And one of the places that they conquered using military means is a place known as the Wolomo. Yes, Christianity got to Wolomo, which is to the south of Axum, through military means. Because the people who were involved when Christianity was taken to this place included military men. So it tells you that Christianity made impact as well on the kings. They did not just accept the religion, but they saw it a duty or it placed a duty on them to spread the faith. And in doing so, they did that through military means. And that also helped them to spread the Christian religion across to other parts. So all of you who called have done so well. But I think so far I am impressed by the answer. You all did well, but only one person would have to win the prize. And the prize would go to Amina. So Amina, if you are still doing the calling, you won the prize for tonight's question of the day. And so Amina, pick this number and call. You identify yourself and then you speak to my producer. Okay. All right. So Amina, we will call you. We don't want anybody to pick the number and call. We'll call you. Congratulations, Amina. And keep watching Joy Learning as we keep learning. Okay, before we close the lesson, we want to look at major achievements of Axum in the area of arts and technology. So far, we've looked at the geographical location of Axum and how it held them to establish contact with other people from other parts of the world. We have also looked at how Christianity was introduced to Axum, the impact it's made on Axum. We've also looked at the various factors that enabled or contributed to the rise of Axum. We want to look at various achievements that Axum made in the area of art in particular and technology as well as metal technology. Now in the area of art, we are told that one major achievement of Axum is in the construction of the stele. The construction of the stele. Or the obelisk. Now, as you can see from our picture, this is an example 
So you see this tall structure is an example of the stele or obelisk. Now we are told that this obelisk, as you, as you can see, was not built by laying on of blocks, but rather it looks a kind of slabs that stands almost 110 feet Now, it was hewn out of rock, or it was cut out of rock. So you realize that there are slabs carefully cut or hewn out by crafted men out of a granite-like stone, or a granite. If you look at this one, you realize that apart from the slabs that you see that stands almost 100 feet tall, this one in particular seemed to have windows. I don't know if it's so clear for you to see, but it's got windows on them, on each layer, from the base right up. And I've told you this was built, or this was made by cutting out, you know, a stone that looks like, or a granite, let's put it that way. They carefully cut off the portions that are not needed until they get this nicely shaped slabs standing a feet of 110 tall. Some of them have doorway at the base. Some of them have doorway. And also others have a well-decorated sacrificial altar. A well-decorated sacrificial altar. And this was constructed by the people of Axum. Now the one you see here is a popular one, the popular stele constructed for King Izana. And we are told that these steles served religious purposes as they had you know a well decorated religious altar and so sacrifices were offered on it for religious purposes at some times too it served as a public notice board so you see how tall it is they could place notices on them for people to read them and sometimes the loss of the lands or decrees by the kings were also posted on these slabs. So these slabs or these stele or obliques, which is a major achievement in the area of art by the people of Axum, is a demonstration of the technology they had in creating such a nice tall, you know, slabs seven religious purposes as well as seven as public notice board i don't know where else we can see such a thing but as of the period fourth century to sixth century bc if axum were creating these things then indeed they were a force to reckon with another achievement let's quickly look at another achievement and that had to do with the construction of edifice. The construction of edifice. Now, with this, these were beautiful tall buildings that also were hewn out of rocks or caves. So this one is a building, not just a notice board. But this was a building carved you know, in a cave or from a rock that stands separate. So let's assume a rock as a place. They could cut it in a way to construct beautiful edifices. Now, one of the famous edifices that were constructed by the Axumite is the edifice at Lali Bella. 
a beautiful edifice constructed at Lali Bella, hewn out of a rock. Now they could hew it from above down or from the sides of the cave to get the structure that they were looking for without having to lay blocks on one another or adding mortar to build. These were created out of rocks. And it's an expression or an example to show us that the people of Axum were very artistic. Yes, and they could think beyond the normal. So they can just look at a rock and see an edifice in a rock. And they will carve it until they set that edifice free from the rock. And then they have their structure. And I've told you that the most famous of these edifices can be found at Lali Bella. All right. Let's look at another achievement of the Axumite in the area of arts and technology as we will be finishing our class very soon. Now, in the area of engineering technology, engineering, we are told that the Axumite expressed or demonstrated their prowess or their engineering skills in the construction of dams they constructed various dams now with the construction of these dams it enabled them to store water for various purposes and huge dams for that matter now it tells us that with the construction of these dams Water can be stored so that in times where they did not have access to water, they can still get water for agricultural activities, for domestic purposes, and for feeding or for watering their animals. So at the end of the day, the prowess shown by the Axumites in the construction of these dams and wells is a demonstration of their ability to construct or to build. These dams sometimes had various religious symbols on them and then was done in a way that portrayed the beliefs of the people of Axum. And they did it to demonstrate their engineering skills. Now let's also look at another important Area when it comes to the achievement of technology. And that has to do with the development of metal technology. We are told that metal technology or the knowledge of working with metals came to Axum or was introduced to the Axumite by the Semitics. You remember the Semitics? Yes, the immigrant from Yemen in Saudi Arabia. So these Arabian immigrants who came to settle among the local Kush population introduced the concept of working with metals or minerals. They introduced them to metals such as iron, bronze, brass, amongst others. So these people were able to now construct various tools which they use for their agricultural activities using these metals. Beyond that, they could also use the brass, for instance, to mint or to cut out coins, to use as a medium of exchange. And as a result of that, they also could use the iron to produce various weapons, which they use for military purposes. And so, Axum was now able to develop the ability to work with metals when they came into contact with the people of Arab, South Arabia, who came to settle amongst them. The final achievement in the area of art we want to look at is in the area of literature. Okay, so in the area of literature, we said earlier that the Semitics who came to settle amongst the Azumites 
came with their writing. And I said earlier that the writing introduced by the Semitics or the immigrants was the Sabian writing or language. Now, the Axumite borrowed the Sabian language and then mixed it with their local language, which is the Kush language, and then they produced the Giz language. Now, this Giz language or the flourish of the Giz language is important because it was with this Giz language that the kings of Axum wrote the literature, the Kebra Negasti. Yes, as they learned the art of writing, they were able to keep the chronicles of the various achievements of the chiefs or the kings. The various conquests that the kings undertook were put together in a book known as the Kebra Negasti. Kebra Negasti means the glory of kings. So we can say that in the area of art, the people of Axum were able to now chronicle the various achievements of the art kings, as well as the various literary pieces they had to put together for various purposes. And then whenever you hear of Kebra Negasti, it is that book that talks about the glory of the kings. And we are told that this book attempted to trace the descent of the kings of Axum to King Solomon. And so they referred to their rulers or their kings as the Solomonic dynasty. That is how much they achieved in the area of literacy. All too soon, we have come to the end of tonight's revision show. I trust you have learned a lot and you have been reminded of what we were taught in first year. And you remember the various steps I took you through as you prepare for your WASI before you start writing your exam. It always a joy learning on joy learning, and we encourage you to keep learning. We'll be back again. We have another history class on the 29th of this month, where we'll discuss a number of questions and help you to solve them. Thanks so much. My name is Albert Kingsley Bray, and I have been your history facilitator for tonight's live show. Joy learning. Keep learning.